What we saw was that, right, the thing we saw that, and the first not obvious thing is that the argument sucks. Right, the argument of the product is the sum of the arguments. But from here we get something, uh, you know, we can start now, now that we have something non obvious or non trivial, we can start taking quite interesting implications of this. Okay, so the first one is the following take N to be R, right? right let's write here in polar coordinates. Okay, now what is A to the N? If we take a to some power, like an integer power, right, what do we get? Right, we get r to the n. Let's say n for now is uh, just positive, let's say positive integer. And we know that the angle will sum, so right, so the angle will just be n. So this is already a pretty uh, pretty interesting formula, and in fact, right, it's it's easy to see that this works for, uh, I guess, for n bigger than zero or integer. Let's say, right? When we write n, we always mean an integer. It's not maybe yet obvious that this right also works also for negative numbers, but it's not also so hard, right? Because just prime a to the minus one, right? We know that the Right, we know that the modulus will will just be the, the inverse of the modulus. And it's not so hard to see that this will just be cosine of minus the angle plus i sine of minus the angle. Right? Why? Why? Because this, right, just by simple rules of trigonometry, is just cosine of phi minus i sine of phi. Right, but now if I take this times times that, right? So if I take, let me use another color to make it a bit more dramatic. So right, if I take cosine of the angle or minus sine i sine of the angle times, right, the, the number, right? This is definitely the inverse of that. I just want to show that this is the inverse of that. So I'm going to plug it in. Right, but this is just a number times its conjugate. And we know this is just a norm squared, right? Which in this case is just cosine of the angle square plus sine of the angle square. And this is one of the most uh, important problems in trigonometry. This is one. So indeed, this is the inverse of A. And so this actually works for all A, right? We do not need this. Okay, so fine, we know how to take powers. And now there's something, you know, if you just apply it to when r is one, so if you just apply it to taking cosine of an angle plus i sine of an angle to the n, then we see, right, by these formulas for any n, right, any integer, we see by these formulas that this is the same cosine of n, uh, n phi plus i sine of n phi. Right? This becomes a very non-trivial statement. And in fact, it has a name. It's known as the Moivre's formula. And it allows you now Right? This is done in sort of a completely you know, conceptual way, right? It's easy to remember. But now it gives you lots and lots of ways to, it gives you very, I mean, I wouldn't say simple, but straightforward ways to write cosine of n uh, of, of say, n phi and cosine of n phi, cosine and sine of n phi in terms of cosine of phi and sine of phi, right? Because now I can write this, right? Right, I can write this as the real part of that.
right? So this means that if I have something like cosine of three phi, all I have to do is take cosine of phi plus i, of I sine of phi, expand the cube, and collect the real, the one, the terms that don't have an i, right? Collect the real part, and this gives me a formula for cosine of three, of three phi, right? So next time you have to use, you know, next time you have to write something like cosine, right? If you have to write something like cosine of the two, say, two phi, and you don't know what this is in terms of cosine of phi and sine of phi, just use this formula, right? And we'll retrieve exactly, um, we'll retrieve exactly the formulas that you know from, from trigonometry. Right, so this Moivre's formula is very useful to compute, uh, you know, to compute things with trigonometric functions. And it comes now from a way that's you know, very easy to remember. But now, you know, because of this, we can also now take roots, right? We can also take nth roots of a number. Right? And now you'll remember that in the first class I said, okay, so do we now need to define the square root of i? Or is it that the square root of i was already there? Right? And I said, oh yeah, the square root of i was easy. You just take like one over root two plus one over root two i, and this square gives you i. And it wasn't quite clear where this was coming from. This is where this was coming from, right? I just was applying exactly this. All right, so let's say that I have, let me use the same notation. I have the end equals A. Right, and I write A in terms of polar coordinates. Right, and of course I have a solution. Right, a simple solution of this is just I take the nth root of R, right, which is a non negative number times uh, cosine of, now I take the angle over n plus i sine the angle over n. Right, and now this allows me to write, uh, you know, allows me to write uh, uh, roots, right? Square roots, and roots, any root. Now, of course, you know, this is not the only solution, of course. Right? If instead I can always take, right, if I take phi over n plus any number that when I multiply by n, I get phi plus a multiple of 2 pi, I'm still okay. Right? I can also do, I can add k 2 pi over n for any k from 0 to n minus 1 integer. Right? Because this, this angle, whenever I take it to Whenever I multiply this by n, I get phi plus k2 pi, right? And k2 pi doesn't change anything, right? I'm just going around the, the, the circle, the minimum circle. Okay, so well, let's see what this gives us. Maybe I'll do it here first. Okay, so we get that like Z right, has a bunch of possible solutions. Right, and we get, uh, let me see if I can write all of this, cosine of pi over n plus two pi k over n. Where for k, okay. Now question: Why do I need to pick? You know, I'm put, sort of this this argument I'm giving. It may not be completely obvious. Why do I need to pick the same k here and here? I'll give you a few seconds to think about this. Right. This way, I have n roots. But if I was allowed to pick different k's, one here and one there. Then I would get uh, many more, right? I would potentially get n squared even. Right? 
I don't know, I can't actually see the text. Did anyone say anything? Yeah, I'll give, think, think about it for uh, five, 10 seconds, and then I'll. Right, okay, so the problem, of course, is that if these angles aren't the same, then you know, this isn't really a polar decomposition, right? And this, these, all these formulas that we worked out don't actually work, right? If the angle inside the cosine and the sine is not the same, then we don't necessarily have that it's a unit norm uh, number, right? And all these, all these formulas of multiplying and so on will not, right? this is not the polar decomposition, those will not be the angles of the, vector, of the number. Okay, so in particular, when A is equal to one, Right, we call the roots the roots of one something special. Right, so when a is equal to one, what we have we have the roots of, of the, what we call the roots of unity. So the n roots of unity, and basically, right, this term disappears, and this term disappears. You just get cosine of two pi k over n plus i sine. Okay, let me write it so. We get cosine of two pi k per n. For k from zero to n minus one, and these are just the vertices of an n regular polygon. Maybe I'll, I'll draw a picture. Symmetric uh, circle. Okay, let's just say, uh, use your imagination that this is a uh, this is a proper circle. I minus I, right? And we can have here, say, uh, one over root two plus one over root two I. We can have here the other one, the other one, and so on. Right, and so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are just the eight roots of unity. These roots of unity. Right? How do we write them? We write them as you know, z equals cosine of two pi uh, k over n plus i sine two pi uh, k over n. K from zero to minus one, and here we're taking n equals eight on the picture, right? And we get adventure drawing a bit more. Uh, you know, we get that this is uh, right, this is uh, or it would be regular if my picture was done properly. But power of abstraction. Okay, so the way we usually write this is we we say that. You know, we call this one, the first one that shows up, we call it W for omega. Right? And then we say, and then because of how we know that uh, that multiplication works, this becomes omega square, omega cube, or omega to the four, and so on and so forth. And omega to the eight will be what? I mean, it is an eighth root of unity. Right? And so oftentimes what we write is we write omega equals cosine of just uh, two pi over n. 
plus i sine 2 pi n. And then the roots of unity are simply omega, or say 1, omega, omega 2, omega square, omega 2, all the way to omega to the n minus 1. And through the unity. Okay. Okay, so we have just just a little more. Uh, this is like a hybrid between our. Housekeeping and uh, surprising things, and then I'll show you one surprising thing before we're done, right? And so this is—I'll uh, go through this very briefly, and then you can read about it more in the book, and uh, maybe this will be covered a bit also in the exercise session, which is the construct of the Riemann sphere. Uh, maybe let me erase this, at least. If there's any questions, please, yeah, go ahead. It's a good time to to pause. So this is an important construction in complex analysis, the Riemann sphere. As we need it, I'll talk about it more. For now, I'll just give you sort of the, the quick, the quick um, yeah, explanation of what the idea is. So the idea is that, and I'll use mostly words, so the idea is that it's very useful to consider the complex plane with an extra point, with infinity. So the idea, the idea, is to add this hash of being between quotes more than an idea, is to add a point infinity to the complex plane. Right? And so you want to consider the complex plane with the point at infinity, right? As part of it. You can call this the extended complex plane. And now you can uh, try to, you know, you can try to understand what kind of operations we can still do with it. It's not so clear what to, what meaning should like infinite plus infinite have. Right, because one if like the infinite point is sort of the point that you reach from going in each direction, so it's not clear you can add them. But it's kind of clear that if you had a number and divide by infinite, you should have zero. Right, if you have a, a number and you multiply by infinity, you should have infinite and all this. Right, so the same thing as with the reals. The big difference is that in complex numbers, it doesn't really make sense to talk about minus infinity and plus infinity. Right, in the reals, because there's an order. Right, you can get to infinity from like two directions. Right, either you go very very negative or you go very, very positive. But over the reals, this is, over the complex numbers, it's not the case, right? So we have just one notion of one point being infinite. And you can now, you know, the, the, the sort of, the way to define this is to say any line in the complex plane will always include infinity, right? If I have a line, then, uh, you know, the line, right? I have a line in the complex plane, it will always include infinity because in the limit, right, it will get to infinity. Okay, but if I take a line, right, if I have my complex plane, and I take any line, then this line will include infinity, but if I take, say, a half space all above the line, this will never include infinity, because, right, infinity was in the, was in the line to start with. Now, the thing that this will, I mean, just to give you sort of a preview, one reason why this, is, this will be nice is that it will make lines behave a lot like circles. Okay, so let me just say that. Okay, because now sort of the lines that don't include infinity will basically be circles in the complex plane, okay? And you'll see why in a second. Okay, but the right way to sort of, you know, the right way of, of, of constructing this or of picturing this is with the so-called Riemann sphere. The idea being that maybe the right way to think of the complex numbers with the point of infinity is to think about it like a sphere, right? If I have the complex plane and I sort of try to fold it on itself, 
right? Then you know the point in infinity, the north pole will be the will be the point in infinity, and the rest is just folded. Sort of the complex plane folds on itself and becomes a sphere. And this is exactly the construction of the of the Riemann sphere. So you take S like R or S two, right? The two dimensional two dimensional sphere. Sphere. Right, by this I mean that it's part, right, that it's inside R3, right? Two dimensional means the sphere itself has two dimensions, which means that it's embedded in, uh, you know, it's embedded in R3, right? So it's the set of the points. Whose norm is one, right? So it's just the set, of, S is the set of points that satisfies this. Okay, so the set of x1, x2, x3, such that. Okay. And now we make a, you know, now we make a, a function or an association between S and the complex plane. We say that a point. Right, so goes to a point in the complex plane that will look like it's, you know, I took it off my hat, but this will make, it will make a lot of sense. Okay, so given a, given a point in the sphere, x1, x2, x3, we give, a, we make it, we associate with it this complex number. Right now we have to argue that this is actually one to one. I won't do the calculations here. I'll just sort of convince you. Right, so one needs to argue that this is actually one to one. I mean, almost one to one. Right? There is a problem, which is when x three is one, the point zero zero one is going uh, well to infinity exactly. But we'll get there. Right? But that this is one to one. Right, maybe the right way of seeing that this is one to one. I mean, you would you have to work it out to, to see that you can actually well, z is a function of course of x1, x2, x3. All you have to argue now is that x1, x2, x3 are actually a function of z. Right? I mean, you have to work it out, but maybe an easy way of seeing why that might be the case is to take the, the norm squared of z. Right? So what is this? This is z times z conjugate, right? So you get, I mean, I don't also know, I get x1 plus i x2 norm squared over, this is a real number, so I just get the square of this. But now, what is this? This is, um, right, this is just x1 squared plus x2 squared over 1 minus x3. Uh, Squared. I think I'm missing a square somewhere. Yeah, go ahead. Ah, bijection. Yeah, yeah, bijection. Okay, did, no, I think it's okay. All right, so let's see. Uh, okay, so far so good. Now this is one minus x3 squared. Right? 1 minus x3 squared because x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared is 1 over 1 minus x3 squared. And now, this is the typo I had. Right? Now, 1 minus x3 uh, squared. Okay, let me change this in another way. Right, so I get one minus x three, one plus x three over one minus x three squared. And this is equal to plus, right? So this is equal to one um, plus x three over one minus x three. I feel like I may have def I may have gotten the definition of this wrong. One
I know, it's okay. Yeah, yeah it's okay. All right, so now you have, uh, yeah, so this is the right, uh, I was afraid that I had missed the square or something here, but no. So, right, I have one minus x3 squared, one minus x3 squared, right? I can write that as this. And so this is equal to, maybe I should, uh, Two, one, three over one minus x two. Right, and now you invert this, and you can write uh, you can write x three. Right, so now this means that x three is equal to uh, one. Okay, and so all, right. all this just to argue that x3 is a function of z, right? And after you have this, you can work out that x1 and x2 are also a function of z. And it's already showing also here the potential issue that if x3 is one, then things can go, uh, can, there can be a problem. And in fact, what we do here is you take the point zero, 0, 1, right, which is the point that that function, this doesn't define very well, right, because you would get something over infinity, over 0, then this associate, you associate to this the point of infinity. Right, okay, so let me now draw a picture. Yeah, so let me, maybe I'll draw a picture here. Uh, the question about your notion um, when asked if one-to-one one is not injective and one-to-one is subjective. So, are you... Are you ah, by here, I was really meaning bijective. Maybe I should just write bijective. Yeah, one-to-one, one, I'm meaning just bijective, right? But I should be more precise. I can just write bijective. Yes, okay. I'll, I'll be more clear. I just mean that this operation is bijective, right? For each point here, we get a complex number that's clear, except for the point zero, zero, 001, which I'm defining the answer to be infinity, Because right? I'm trying to represent the complex plane with an added point at, at infinity. Now, what I have to argue is that, right, no two points go to the same place. That's not obvious at all, right? I mean, there's some equation, right, with three variables going to just one, thing in a complex plane is not obvious at all that two points x1, x2, x3, different ones, cannot possibly go to the same complex number. And I'm not actually proving that. You should look at it in the book, because I mean, it's just a lot more calculations, uh, very prone to, to typos. But what I, what I argued here is that at least x3 is completely determined by this complex number. Right, and then once you have one, it's not so hard to see that the other two are also uh, completely determined by the complex number. You just work it out. Right, the point is that you have three numbers here, but they satisfy an equation, right? So there's really only two freedom, right? It's a two-dimensional sphere. The complex plane is also two-dimensional, so at least you know, it's consistent with that. Okay. Uh, but yeah, when I say one-to-one, -one, I mean by Always, I think, yeah. Maybe I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll try to draw the picture here. Uh, okay, I mean, there's also, yeah, I guess, the, the, maybe I should add a sentence, right? What I argued really was that it was injective. You're completely right. I didn't argue that it takes the whole complex plane, right? But if you look at how you can write x3 in terms of z and also x1 and x2, for any z, you can also get an x1, x2, x3 that gives it, right? But you do need to work out the expressions, right? Yeah, I can't see, can you? Um, what about uh, like it's, it's zero, 
I'll, I'll just. Uh, oh, I don't have. I think it's answered, right? Someone answered, I think. Ah, yes, yes. All right. So someone asked, what about if you get, you know, x1, x2, x3, but for them to, and x3 is one, but x1, x2 is something else, then of course, you know, in order to satisfy this, the other two need to be zero. Okay, so let me draw a picture. I wanted to show you something. Interesting. So the right picture to have in mind, you know, for the for the Riemann sphere, and you'll see this in exercise class, not today, maybe next week. So think of this as S. Let me try and draw and draw a nice picture. Okay. So this is the plane. Right? This is the this is our three. Right. This is the north pole. Okay, and now I'm identifying this with the complex plane. Right, so this is the zero from the, from the complex plane, but also the zero of R3, right? So I mean, I'm identifying this R2 with the complex plane, right? I'm identifying x1, x2, zero with the complex plane. So now, if I have a, if I have a, a point Z, Right, where you get, you know, real part of, uh, right, if I have a point of Z, it turns out that its image in the, in the Riemann sphere will be the intersection. Okay, so try to, yeah, maybe not so easy to see this picture, let's see, I'm going to draw another one, so take, right, so take, take a point in the, take a point in the sphere, let's say, Right, and I'll take the line, so this is the point in the Riemann sphere, right? It has x1, x2, x3. And I'll take the line from the North Pole that goes to that point and then intersects what I'm identifying as the complex plane. Right, some other z. Right, this is the stereographic projection. This is the mapping. Right, and, and said this way, it's a lot more natural. Right, and then you just work out what is the equation for the mapping, and it also becomes a lot more natural why it's injective and surjective and so on. And why, if the point that I'm doing the projection of is the North Pole, I have to go to infinity, right? Because if this point here, I move it closer and closer and closer to the North Pole, right? I get that this starts moving further and further away, and then the limit will be at infinity. And so this also makes sense why this point gets identified with infinity. Okay, so how do you see that this is actually, you know, how do you see that this is actually the, that that mapping in the stereographic projection, right? One way to see this is to see that these three points are collinear, right? You go see what are the, you know, if this is x1, x2, x3, so what's the value of that, right? It's the real part of that, so it's x1, 1 minus x3, right? The complex part of it, so x2, 1 minus x3, and then 0, right? In this representation, this is where z is, right? And so all you have to show is that this point, the North Pole, And uh, and uh, x one, x two, x three. That these three points are collinear, right? So you just show that these three points are collinear, and this is very easy, right? Because you just take. I want to show you. Yeah, right? we have I guess ten minutes. I still want. I want to show you something interesting and surprising about functions. So. I'll go through this quickly, but try it yourself. Just, you know, to see that these points are collinear, just take, you know, think of this as a vector, this vector going from here, here, and the vector going from here, here, and just see that they're, the, you know, that they are multiple of one another, right? So you take this minus this, and this minus this, and it's easy to see that they're multiple of one another. 
right? You'll get some kind of one minus x3, which is exactly this one minus x3, and everything cancels out. Okay, so let's get to functions in the last uh, eight minutes. Because I promised something surprising, and uh, I want to deliver on it. Yeah, so there's many interesting properties of this sphere. And this will be very useful when, when we want to include if we want to include infinity in a complex plane, it's very useful to think in, in these terms. For now, we won't need it. And some of the nice properties is that circles, you know, circles in the Riemann sphere will basically be circles in a complex plane, all they'll be lines. If they go through infinity, and you'll get lots of uh, you know, very nice transformations of and predictable transformations of shapes. Okay, so seven minutes. Let's start talking about function. This is really the object of study of uh, of this course. Right? It's functions of complex variables. So we take. We really want to study objects, functions, from the complex plane to the complex plane. Right? This is what the course is about. Right? So far, we've sort of just been creating a language to, to describe the things in, but this is really what we, what we care about. Right? Of course, we can define many types of functions. Right? You can define, now, we, now that we have the complex plane, we can define functions from reals to reals, which we, you already worked with a lot from analysis, from reals to complex numbers. Right, which will be very nice to describe curves in the complex plane, right? A function that goes this parameterized by a real and goes around in the complex plane. But we can also now talk about functions from the complex plane to the real, like the absolute value, right? Or functions from the complex plane to the complex plane. Right? We can of course take limits just in the same way. We say that you know the limit of f as x tends to a is big A, same uh, epsilon and delta story, right? If for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists uh, there exists a delta bigger than zero such that uh, if if x minus a is smaller than delta and x is different than a, then Right, f of x. Right, same exact definition. Right, nothing changes. Pure, pure housekeeping, making sure that everything is fine. Right, so you can define the limits this way. Then it's sort of obvious that if that's the case, then you know the limit of of f conjugate is a conjugate. That the limit of the real part of f. Is just the real part. Okay, I won't write the x going to a, but it's understood. And the limit of uh, the imaginary part of f is just the imaginary part of a. Right? It's kind of also clear that if you know if these limits exist, then uh, both these limits exist, and the limit of f also exists. Right? But of course, if one of them exists and the other doesn't, then they won't. OK, and is of course, f is continuous. At, right, at a, if this limit is actually f of a. Right? And we say that f is continuous if, uh, if f is continuous everywhere. Right? Same, same exact thing as in analysis. Right? And if f is continuous and the function g is continuous, then the sum is continuous, the difference is continuous, the quotient is continuous as long as the, the thing that you're dividing by isn't zero, the product is continuous, you know, all the things that you, that you had from analysis, the proofs are exactly the same. Right? If you go see the proofs that you've done back in analysis with epsilons and deltas, they rely a lot on absolute values, right? Because the whole definition relies on absolute values. But really, the only thing that's important about the absolute values 
is that is that is things like if you go look at, at all these proofs, right? They sometimes use things like this, and they sometimes use things like this. And that's basically the only thing they use. And so they work just fine over, over complex numbers. Everything is the same. OK, so all of this to give you in the last three minutes sort of the first surprising, the first surprising fact. Okay. And this, I, I think, already hints at, uh, at uh, how deep the theory will be for, for complex analysis. So let's look at the derivative, right? I mean, so we're going to define the derivative exactly the same way that we defined it over the wheels. Yeah, maybe let me define it with increments. Okay, this is the same definition as derivative from, uh, you know, from real analysis. Now, it's really key. The key difference here, and this is one of the most important. I think this is one of the most. I'll, I'll repeat all of this next lecture, but this is one of the most important points. Is that when we define derivative for this limit to exist, you know, over the reals, when we had something like this. The increment's going to zero, it could have come from the left or it could have come from the right. Right? So the only thing we had to make sure is that the, sort of the derivative from the left and the derivative of the right were the same, right? They couldn't be a kink. But now h can come from anywhere in the complex plane. Right? And this will be critical. Okay? So h has a lot of freedom because it can approach zero, right? H can be approaching zero from here, from here, from here, here, from anywhere. Right? And this will be, and the, and the limit the existing means that the limit needs to be exactly the same. Right? And this will be, this will have many, many, many consequences. In particular, here's a consequence now that, I mean, just to highlight how, how different the theory of functions will be in a complex plane, that this is where things really get interesting. Let's say that I have a function f such that f of a is actually real for all a in the complex plane. Set. Okay, it doesn't even need to be in a complex plane. It could be just you know on an open uh, inter on an open set in a complex plane. But let's say. Okay, now let's look at the derivative. All right, so let's look at what the derivative is for a certain point k. Okay, this is a WA and this is a fixed A. All right, so this is that limit, right? Okay, so I'll take one minute. But now this limit needs to be the same if I approach it in the real axis or in the y axis. So I can take H to be, say, T, where T is real. I'll use T for reals a lot. Right? And so if I do that, if I take this, then what do I get? I get that you know f prime of a needs to be the limit of f a plus t minus f a. So this is real over t. So this means that f a prime is real. Right? I'll do this again next. Uh, I'll do this again next lecture, but sort of clear that if I take h to be a real number, then everything in this, in, this, in this limit, in this definition, is real, right? Because this is real, this is real, and this is real. However, if I take instead h to be a purely imaginary number, right, then Right? If you think about what happens, this is f of something, so it's real minus f, it's real, but it's divided over by it. Right? So it would be a purely imaginary number. It would be a multiple of i. So you have a number that is both real and purely imaginary, it needs to be zero. Okay? I'll do this again at the beginning of the next lecture. But this is already, I think, a striking fact. 
if a function takes values only in the real numbers, then it actually theoretically needs to be zero if it's to be differentiable. So in particular, you know, the modulus isn't a differentiable function. Even the modulus squared, which you would expect to be a nice function. And so for a function to be differentiable over the complex numbers is sort of a very special property. And this is what gives rise to such a nice and powerful theory. Okay, sorry for taking a couple of minutes more. I'll stick around a bit if there's any questions. Okay, let me see if I can draw a nicer picture. A few of you asked to talk a bit more about the, the Riemann sphere. Yeah, so I mean, I didn't describe it uh, in much detail. The point is just so that you know what it is when you, uh, when you next encounter it. And if we encounter it again, I'll go over it more carefully. But the idea is to take, maybe instead of giving you the formula, I should have started by drawing the picture. Um, yeah, maybe in hindsight, uh, I should have drawn the picture before I, before I write the formula. So take, Okay, so this is the plane, um, right? This is like R2, I mean, identified with R2, identified with the complex numbers. This is the North Pole, right? This is, this is R3 for real, right? Okay, now what I'm saying is, for any point here in the sphere, let's call it x1, x2, X3, I'm going to identify a point on the complex plane. Okay, maybe I should not have this, right? Which is done, which is done by taking a line from the North Pole through the point in the sphere and onto the, the, the complex plane, okay? So now it's much clearer that this operation is uh, both injective and surjective, right? I mean, two points, well, okay, think about it, right? I can get to any point in the complex plane because wherever is the point in the complex plane, if I, right, if I draw, if I draw, um, right, the only thing that's tangent to the North Pole is the line that's parallel to this axis, to this plane. So whatever point I have, I'll eventually intersect the sphere. Right, so it definitely gets to everywhere on the complex plane, and no two points get to the same place because it's very easy to invert this operation. You just given a point here, you just draw a line to the right to the North Pole, and you pick the point to intersect. Okay, now, and you'll never intersect in two, right? Because if you intersected in two, you would have been actually intersecting in three because you also intersect at the North at the North Pole. Okay, now a few things about this operation. One is, you know, the points outside this circle, right, let's say this is like the unit circle in the, let me draw here the complex plane. Like this is the, the, the circle that I drew over there, right? Like this. The points inside the circle, Right? It's, it's intersection, when I do this operation, will be on the, on the south and hemisphere. Right? The points outside the unit circle will be in the northern hemisphere. Right? This point gets sent to infinity, right? to this new point, because the whole point of building this construct was to, to consider the complex plane with infinity in it, right? in a way that infinity doesn't appear to be that special of a point. Right, because now if I define my things on this sphere, the North Pole and rotate it, everything should be still the same. Right now, there was the, there was this formula, right, that I that I started by writing the formula, which in hindsight I think was a mistake. I should have done the picture first. Right, if you work out what is this, this is called a stereographic projection, right? It's not, a, it's not a projection in the sense of you know, linear algebra projection. Then this, uh, this, uh, this is what you get, right? And this is not so hard. I mean, maybe working it out is not that, uh, is not that simple, but it's also not that hard. But verifying it is definitely easy, right? Because what are these points? In my identification, this point 
is just the point x1 over 1 minus x3, x2, 1 minus x3, and 0. Right? And now I just have to show that these three points are collinear. But that's easy, right? Because just write this minus that. So x1, say x2, x3 minus um, uh, that 0, 0, 1. And this point, x1, um, 1 minus x3, x2, 1 minus x3, uh, 0, minus also 0, 0, 1. Right, and then these points are the same. Up to, right, if you take this, if you take this point, let me use another term, right? Saying that they are collinear is the same thing as saying these two vectors are multiple of one another. So if you take this and multiply by 1 minus x3, you get exactly the point above. Right? Yeah. Okay, and so this is the verification that it works. Yeah, in hindsight, uh, yeah, I, I should have started with the picture and then work out the expression. But for now, we won't actually use this. But the nice thing is that, I mean, this is not completely obvious, but the nice thing is that now, like if I take a line on the plane, this will be a circle on the, on the sphere. And if I take a circle on the sphere, sometimes it's a line, sometimes it's a circle, but there's lots of very, very nice geometric, uh, geometric properties that are satisfied. And so this is, uh, yeah, this is called the Riemann sphere. I mean, as a side note, I guess like Cauchy and Riemann were sort of the, you know, the founders of complex analysis in one way or another. And you may notice this from the names that are given on the different theorems and results that sort of, you know, Cauchy had more of an analytic view of things and Riemann had a more geometric view of things. So often constructions and theorems that are more geometric in nature will be named after Riemann and the ones that are more analytic will be named after Cauchy. It's not a rule, but uh, it's the Riemann sphere and it's very much in line with that. Okay, uh, if, uh, yeah, thank you. If there's any other questions, I'm, yeah, I'll can still be around for a bit more for sure.